Spotlight panel on Scott Snyder and uh, on James Tynan IV. I've known this guy for a little while, so uh, I was racking my brain of what sort of questions I might ask him that I might not know the answers to. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, once we, once we get through a few of my questions, I want to throw it open to the crowd to really you know make this a dialogue, and you can get all sorts of crazy stories out of this guy. So uh, let's do it. Yeah, the way I like to run this is basically. Uh, have sort of have a friend ask a few questions and get started with it. It's really a place for you guys to ask anything you want about the books, about the industry or the craft or anything you want. I, I love like coming to cons for the reason that writing is a really lonely job. You know, and he'll tell you. I'm, I bug everybody to talk on the phone all the time. It's just you in a room, you know, by yourself. And so coming to cons, I feel like it's my chance to get to talk to you guys a bit online, all of that, and this particular kind of environment is the best for it, where you can ask, I want to give you guys a chance to ask anything you want and really have a dialogue and say thank you, honestly, for giving me a dream job, you know? I get to wake up and get to go to work on Batman and everything every day, it's crazy. So this is sort of my uh, opportunity to actually have a dialogue with you guys about stuff. So anything you want to ask, don't be shy. Okay? All right, good. All right, hit me. Yeah. I don't know what these questions are. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to pry you on <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the piece of work that made you realize you wanted to spend your life writing in the first place? Like that, that yeah. seminal, seminal starting point, or, or just to, can you pinpoint a moment that you really knew you wanted to write? Yeah, I can actually. I was, I was uh, about eight and my parents sent me away to Tets Out of Evil, but they sent me away to Sleepaway Camp, it was this uh, eight week athletic camp and it was all boys. I don't know if anyone has been to like a sorry to turn that off. Anyone has been to like a uh, athletic like no go. But anyway I was, like, I was like a little geeky Dungeons and Dragons boy. I was like a little chubby kid and it was like this very intense athletic camp uh, in upstate New York and I would just hide arts and crafts the whole time. I hated it. Um, and uh, anyway the thing I liked it, like it was the kind of camp where they had color war and uh, at the end of the year like you were chosen that color for life and people still showed up at the camp and were like, great team, you know, like you're 60 years old. What does the matter with you? <laughs> anyway, um, and the weirdest was like on the night that you get chosen for one team or another, all the seniors come running into your room, all the freshmen are like, fresh meat, you know, and they pull you up to this cafeteria and you're on this like stage in front, of, I'm sure it was like three feet high, but in my mind it was like a hundred feet tall, you know, in front of the whole camp. And the two teams like actually pretend to play tug of war with you to see which team is going to get you. And I was wearing all gray. And actually, I, I, yeah, I was, I was team gray. I mean, I was wearing all gray. I'm sorry, I was wearing all green. Uh, I was wearing my Hulk like pajamas and stuff like that. Literally, like Hulk stuff. And I got picked for the gray team, and they were like, "Take that stuff off!" And they like pulled my stuff off, and I was in my underoos. I remember being pulled down the side and just being so humiliated. Um, and that's when I know it's not what I want to be a writer. <laughs> um, I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. I want, I want to look back and be like, they were actually Batman on the roofs. <laughs> that's why. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm like in a corn maze right now. But the, um, the one thing I really look forward to, we had this one counselor, I remember his name was Ted, and every night he would read to us from Eyes of the Dragon, the Stephen King book, and I've never, I never, I was young, man, it was way over our heads, I think, you know, which was probably a bad influence. But anyway, he he started on the first night and he finished it on the last night of eight weeks. And I just looked forward to that so much. Every day I, like, I was couldn't wait to go in the book and hear another chapter about Flag and Roland and all that stuff. And I still remember that joy. And that was when I really began to think about wanting to write. It's when I started to like to take Dungeons and Dragons seriously, as weird as that sounds, and want to be Dungeon Master and tell stories. And, my handwriting still bears the residual traces of my dungeon master handwriting, I swear to God, where my A is like all Baroque, you know, it's like a weirdly, weirdly dungeon, it's very weird. Um, but anyway, um, that was, that's kind of where it began for me, and then when I got back, I, I really fell in love with reading a lot more than I had before that, and started to tell my own stories, and it was really around then, and then in fourth grade, I had a great 
a great writing class, and I just knew I wanted to do it. But I wanted to be a comic book writer artist, not a writer writer for a long time. Well, once you uh, once you started studying uh, writing in uh, college and grad school at Brown and Columbia, what do you think that like is there a p particular piece of advice or guidance that that you think like shaped your work the most? I know like I w I was a student of Scott, so I can point to many things that this guy uh, you know p popped into my head that really shaped me into the writer I am today. Yeah, I had, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I like I had a teacher. I had a teacher in, um, I had a couple moments, but I think the one that I point to is I was uh, in 12th grade and I, I had fallen in love with the idea of being a comic book writer and artist. And I took this writing class and um, I wrote this story for it and I just, I kept writing it. We had this, uh, at the end of the year, everybody like read their stories and, um, at, and one of the kids would have it would be over their house with their parents. And I wrote this story that I just loved. It was like about Jack the Ripper. But it was like that he had a he actually had a brother in America and he lived in this crane. It was like completely I'm sure it was terrible. But it was I, I was just so in this and um, on the day that we read, she basically told um, uh, we'd all go in a line and I was the last person alphabetically and we kind of ran out of time before I was about to go. And I was so upset because I wanted to read for my parents and she's like, Oh you have like a minute, you know, so I read. And I was reading and got cut off very quickly. And um, I remember I like I called her up, uh, and you're, you know obviously like it's a, it was a big taboo. I I called the school and said I don't remember what my lie was, but I had some lie where I was like I need her number because this this and this. And I called her up and I was like I at home and I was like I'm so hurt by this, you know like I I, I cared so much about this class all. And I was I mean this is the wrong thing to do. This was like the total a hole move because I was just a kid. But I was like. I cared about this thing so much, you know, and, and you just gave me a minute and she was like, she was like, uh, you call me up at my house, you bother me on a Sunday, and you, you know, you're telling me this, and like, I have a life, and that, and she was like, you know something, you're a real writer. <laughs> and I was like, because I'm being a jerk. She was like, <laughs> and I sat down with her after that, and she was like, you know what, um, I'm going to give you advice, because so she's like, I see you, you have like the affliction of writing, is what she called it. <laughs> And she was like, always write the story that you would like to pick up and read more than any other, and never care about any other things. Like, whatever you're in the mood for, you pick that story up, you write that story. It's, it doesn't matter if it's the funniest, or the smartest, or the, if it's political, or if it's memoir. And that is literally, I'll tell you, the advice that I start every class with when I teach, whether I teach at college, or grad school, or through DC. Write the comic or the story that you would be inspired to pick up and read that day, and that's it. That's the only, that's like the compass for me. What was your first publisher? Like, like, yeah. My first, I, I went to grad school for writing, and um, I sent a lot of, I did that whole, because one of the things is like, I had a really easy ride in comics. I feel like, I don't know who I like, killed in a former life, and like, gave it to the devil to have like, the best ride. But I had a very, pretty, pretty easy time in comics in that I was hired at a time when DC was really looking for new writers, and they gave me a chance on Detective, and American Vampire, and all that. So, I didn't, I didn't have like that grind that a lot of people at cons like this, they're really trying to break in, have, and I'm very grateful and lucky with that. But I did go through that grind in prose, uh, is one of the things I'd say. So I, I, learned, I basically fell more into writing prose when I was in college, because they didn't have comic book classes, right? And I, took a, I went to school at Brown so that I, could, I wanted to take classes at RISD and, and be an illustrator, like Frank Miller and Mike Mignola, I wanted to do both. But I couldn't take the art classes because the schedules didn't match up, and I fell more into writing. And so I went to Christ, I went to Disney World, and worked there for a year after. And had this whole, had this whole kind of year where I was like, my parents were like, "If you want to be a writer, you got to work in a publishing house." And I was like, "I'm not doing that. I'm going to be a janitor in Disney World, and work in Las Vegas, and I need experience." And I did all that stuff, and I came back to grad school. And when I was there, I started working on stories, and I tried to send them out, and I just got rejected everywhere. I was rejected for like years, you know, for two years. So just hundreds and hundreds of stories you sent out and just self-addressed stamped envelope, check the mail, is it a thin envelope coming back? Oh. You know, or it's like always just over and over. And I honestly the funniest thing is I swear I told them like I think it was a year, a year or two ago, I got a rejection for a story I had sent out ten years ago. And I was like, you hated it that much that you had to like, you know, you just, you to just like and it still hurt my ego. So now, I'm like, I don't even know if it, you know, still. And then another time I told them I got three 
rejections from the same magazine for the same story. And it's like they rejected it once, and I was like, oh. And then they sent another rejection for it, and I was like, I get it, you don't like it. And then they sent a third one that they had put in their own envelope and put a stamp on themselves, like they had taken the time to pay it for an envelope to like reject the same story a third time with this new letter. And I was like, oh my god, I am that bad. <laughs> And anyway, um, I, I got more into it at that point and sold, sent stuff out a lot and I taught, you know, I taught high school and tutored rich kids and all that kind of stuff for a while and finally got a story into a magazine called Zoetro. It was run by Francis Ford Coppola and those guys out in San Francisco and they found me off the slush, literally found me off the slush. And one thing I'd say, if you're interested in short story writing, like in, in prose, once you begin to get published, and this is true of comics too, he'll tell you, once you get one gig, they start to multiply if you if you kind of do an okay job with that. And so that really opened the door very quickly. And other then I could say to other magazines, well, I have a story coming out in this one, and they'll be like, if one of them somebody likes this kid, maybe we'll like him. They start looking at you more seriously. And so once you get your foot in the door, it starts to, you know, it starts to kind of be, be easier after that. But what was that first story about? Uh, it was called Blue Yodel. It was basically about, it was about a guy, it's, it was super weird, it was about a guy um, who is chasing a blimp, it takes place in the 1920s, and it's about a guy who's driving a Model T across the country at that time, chasing this blimp, because he believes that the girl he loves is inside this blimp. <laughs> and um, it's his journey across the whole, across the whole country in this broken down Model T, and following this blimp, and you don't know if it's real or not, and all this kind of stuff, and then, uh, yeah. I look back on thinking, but um, I really it was that was that was it. Well, once you like once you were sort of established in that world, you broke over into the comics industry. Even though, like, I'm sure at that moment it seemed like you were going towards the the prose world uh, pretty firmly. And then, but when comics reemerged as like a core part of your life, what did it did you feel like it really offered you? What did you? How did it like open you up? And why why are comics such a good home for you? They're great. I don't miss prose at all. It's funny. I thought I would. I mean, I, I studied, you know, I went to school for prose and all that stuff. And the reason I thought of comics, like I said, was I just didn't have the opportunity to do art, really. And, and I had a portfolio, which I still threaten to break a pool with sometimes. I'm like, look how good this was. And it's not good at all. But I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do a variant one day. And I'm always like, if I could just do one variant for that at one time, you know, that would be great. But anyway, um, one day I will have my way. But the, um, the, what happened was, uh, I, I, I've told this story, so forgive me if you've heard me talk before, um, but I, uh, I came out of grad school and it was a different time and, and everybody was getting these very big book deals at that moment. The economy was very different and there was a lot of big successes in books right now. Like Jonathan Safran Four and Nicole Krauss, a lot of like big debut. Everyone was looking for like big debut writers so that they could do these books that would become movies and, and there was just a lot of hype and money. And I got one of these book deals. I was really lucky and got this, you know, very lucrative book deal. And I was, I was totally an idiot, though. I didn't realize that when you get a book deal, um, like I had a, a short story collection and a novel, and most of the money was weighted towards the novel. But what I also didn't understand is that that money is, it doesn't come unless they approve the book you're working on, and they can they can retract it, <laughs> and then they can say, actually, you owe us money for the advance because we reject the book. So now you have to pay us back. And I was just like an idiot and. I, I, I sold the story collection, it went well, and uh, I sold this, this novel idea, it was about a barnstormer um, uh, at the same time, and I started working on this book, and I really loved it, and we had a great time in the story collection, I had this big paycheck coming if they liked the book, and we bought a house, and we had a kid, and my wife was in school, and all of a sudden the economy just started collapsing in 2008. <laughs> And all of a sudden you noticed in books that suddenly they weren't just taking the book that they had said, sure, you know, write your book and we'll take it and then you see this is an investment in you and, and we'll give you the money even if the book isn't quite what we want, it's not a bestseller, we're investing in you for life, like for a long term. It was like, this book better be good. <laughs> and it was like, oh no, this is, this is not good. And um, it became, I loved the book and they were very nice to me, but it became a moment when they, I just realized I, I, was, I was so depressed. I mean, I've always had trouble with depression and anxiety and stuff. And, and this was a moment when I just knew they were never going to take this book. And I was going to work on it desperately, trying to make it more commercial every day. And I'll never forget that feeling. And I was tutoring all this stuff to make money. And, and I would go to work hating this book. And I loved the idea. And so all I was trying to do was make it more and more like love story and action and this, because I was desperate to make money. And doing the thing that you love, like that you've always wanted to do, and hating it is just 
the worst feeling in the world. And I, I was admittedly like I was drinking too much, I was depressed, I hated it. And then in that weird moment, as James would tell you, he was my student right around this time. And I remember coming to him and because he knew all this continuity stuff. And I was like, I did a re basically, I got invited by my buddy Owen King, um, who I'd been in writing school with, um, uh, to be in an anthology. It was like prose writers make up new superheroes, and most of the superhero stories were really funny. They were just kind of silly. They were like, a support group for superheroes with terrible powers, right? It was one of them, and it was like, one guy, like, he never had to go to the bathroom, and he was just like, where does it all go, you know? And, <laughs> and another one was about a superhero called the Meerkat, and mine was really serious. I tried, you know, serious, but I tried to do one that was like more heavy and dark about a kid who was in the bikini age all tests, and comes back, and feels very different, and something's wrong with him, and, and anyway, these two comic book editors came to the launch for that book, and um, it was Mark Doyle and Janine Schaefer, one from DC, one from Marvel, and they asked if anyone was serious about comics, and I was like, I don't have comics in my bag, I'm a big comic fan, and they were like, well, would you like to pitch? And I was like, yeah. And so I started pitching, and my wife, I remember, was like, why are you pitching for these things? Comics pays nothing. I mean, and it really, it does not pay much, like, you know, when you're starting out at all, as many of you, I'm sure, know, it's not. She's like, if you just finish your book, you know, you'll have this big book deal and stuff, and I was like, you know why? Because it's like the only fun I've had in writing in two years, like is writing this and writing that story I wrote for that book because I hate working on this book. And she was just like, well, all right then, why don't we do this? Why don't we take out another loan and why don't you try doing that instead? And I was like, really? She was like, yeah, let's do it. And, and she's great. I mean, I love her for that too. And I did. I was like, I dissolved the book deal. I paid them back some money. And, I, and they were very sweet to me. They were never mean, but it was sort of like, you know, they were like, admittedly, I think relieved that they would never have to deal with this book again, um, and I wouldn't either, and um, uh, I started pitching really hard, and I got into that, and what I realized was the thing that, that really makes me love comics more than prose, and it's not like I'll never write prose, I have a kid's book actually I'm working on on the side that he knows about, I'm really proud of, that it's more of like an 8 to 12 year old um, kind of group, just for myself, um, is that I, I, I've never, like I said, I've, I've always been somebody that I love being social, going to cons and that stuff, but I also, I've had really a lot of uh, moments in my life where I've had trouble with, with um, depression and, and those things, and you know, I feel okay talking about that stuff, and um, writing prose did not sit well really with me when I didn't live in the city anymore. We moved to a more rural area um, in Long Island, and being alone all day and working on a book with nobody to talk to and no one, no contact with anybody was not good for my mental health, I realized. And while I was in grad school, and while I was writing prose when I lived with a bunch of other writers and we were kids, it was awesome because you write, write a story, then you tear it apart with each other, and you're part of a community, whatever. But when you're doing it professionally by yourself, it's lonely. It's a lonely job. And you know, it's great, but so comics, the great thing is like, I called the pool, I was just talking to him this morning, you know, and I'm like, dude, that moment is amazing, I love that. He's like, yeah, man, blah, blah, blah. see you in two weeks, you know, and then I'm like, hey, you know, yesterday I uh, was talking to Jock, you know, and it's like, Jock, you know, and he said, we're working on the second arc of witches, and he was talking about the designs and all that stuff, and it's so collaborative. It's just, it's such a joy to get to work with people you love as friends and also as, as you know, colleagues that you admire and go to work that way and deal with them and have a team like working on Batman, working on all these books where you're in it together. That collaborative aspect to me really is the magic of comics where you're making this living thing together all the time. And a lot of it comes from that collaboration. Like the, 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 the excitement and energy in a comic and an issue comes from the back and forth. You can feel it when it's not there, when it's disconnected. You can feel, I think, like, I had one artist I worked with once, um, very briefly, really early in my career, where he never wanted to, and nothing against this at all, he never wanted to uh, communicate. It was always like, send me the script and I'll draw it, and that's it. And I hated that, it was miserable, you know? I, I, it was, what's the point, you know? And for me, it's like, we get on the phone all the time, and I always warn whoever I'm working with, like, I was talking to Sean, because I'm doing, I'm going to do some Batman stuff with Sean Murphy soon, I was talking to him, and, uh, early, when I first started with my American Vampire, I was like, I have to warn you, like, I'm going to bug you a lot, call you up, be like, you know, I want your input, I want you to change the story, I want you to make it yours, and all that. And those are the guys I work with, they all love that, um, to work that way, I mean, we work that way together, so those artists that I like to work with, like Jock and Francesco and Sai, we have that relationship where we like the back and forth, you know, I like them to change my the page, and I like reacting to it, changing my dialogue, that constant back and forth is really fun. So, uh, taking it to Batman for a second, uh, or not for a second, we'll talk about Batman all day, uh, but I, 
I think that, that you know, it's pretty clear right now that what you've been doing on uh, the bat books for the last four years has just been absolutely, you know, it, it has taken everyone, it has taken the entire industry by storm. And I think there's a, it's clear you have a very strong connection to Bruce Wayne. And I just wanted to sort of ask you, like, how much of yourself do you see in Bruce when you're writing him, but then also when other people are writing him? When it, like, Bruce Wayne is the larger concept rather than just your Bruce. That's a great question, actually. Uh, I've not thought of it that way. Um, well, I think I've always Bruce has always been my favorite character, but it's been for different reasons. Like when I was a kid, I, I lived in New York in the '80s, and when Frank Miller did Year One and Dark Knight Returns, it was like. Batman became very, very real to me, where in year one, he was dealing with the city as it looked to me. Times Square looked that way, and it was run down, and I couldn't go to Central Park, or I couldn't get on the subway, you know, I was not allowed to do all these things and stuff. And, you know, there was the sense of, 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 of jeopardy for the city all the time, and, and there was Batman. And similarly, Dark Knight Returns was the same thing, but translated into comic book language, where it wasn't, it wasn't openly about, you know, um, the Cold War or this or that, but all those things are in there in these big ways, and they're just translated into comic book language, which honestly is what we're trying to do with Super Heavy, the story we're doing now in Batman is, the issue we just did, issue 44, which deals with sort of more uh, entrenched kind of um, systemic problems, is sort of what the whole arc is about, but most of it is translated into like the deepest comic book language possible, where it's like monsters and energy, monsters and robots and whatever, but that's what it's sort of about, and that lesson I learned from the Miller stuff really was you can go either way with it, and that Batman I loved, I think, because it was so um, it was so of that moment for me. And over the years, there was always a Batman that spoke to a rooster, that spoke to some aspect of my my personality. Like I loved the animated stuff um, so deeply when I was in college because I felt like. Bruce became more of a sort of a cipher, and that series was more about finding characters that lived in Gotham and exploring their experiences in different ways. And then, for me, with Grant, it was so different. So my Bruce, I think the thing that I always come back to with Bruce Wayne is just his mortality, the fact that he is, he's so human as much as he's this incredible kind of, you know, um, a pinnacle of human achievement. When you look at him in Dark Knight, or in, even in Grant stuff, which you know figures him so larger than life, there's still this mortality. There's the sense that he's human, standing next to all these gods and all of these obstacles that seem impossible to overcome. And his villains are larger than life, and yet Alfred and all these other things ground him. He's just he's just a guy, you know. And I love that aspect of him, that pathos, where he's he sacrifices his body and all this stuff every night for the city in this kind of strange way, and yet at the same time. He's, he becomes this thing that's abstract, this legend, this ghost, this samurai, this kind of phantom. But deep down, he's still just a flesh and blood person who is aging and is, you know, is is deeply vulnerable. And that that nexus is just endlessly interesting to me because it's about us. So I love the idea that Bruce is essentially to me. I think, and you tell me what you think, but I, I, I've been looking at our run a lot because obviously, it's when you're 50 and and talking about what we're going to do next, and you know, we're not sure how long we'll be on the book, or how long both of us will be on the book, or I'll leave, or Craig will leave, but we're not sure. We're really not sure yet. Um, but I will tell you this, like, we're going to be a team for a long time, and whatever we do, we'll, we'll, we're, we, have, we have a lot of stuff we want to do together. Um, and I have, I have ideas I really like to do on Batman also, um, in different ways, whether in the main series or separately after 50 as well. But I've been looking back, and one of the things that I really love about Bruce, um, our version, or I think that I connect to, is that as a kid, I think I needed him to be the symbol of as you want him to scare everybody back into the shadows. You know, and that's what he was. He was this kind of demon, and like in a pre 9 11 world, it was like, I'm going to take the city back for you, and I'm going to show you everyone better be afraid of me, and I'm going to beat up this guy and put this guy in jail and, and get everybody. And, and it was that kind of death wish, dirty, hairy feel a little bit to, to Batman, and not in a bad way, but in a way that was sort of like empowering this kind of fantasy about him. And since then, I feel like we tried hard, not even deliberately, but it just is the way I feel for my kids. That they don't really need a symbol of somebody that says, you know, I can do this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the city back from, from the bad guys. It's more or less a symbol of, of, it's less a mission of scaring bad guys back into the shadows than it is inspiring good people to be brave in a city where obstacles seem whether they're social issues that are entrenched and, and intractable and really difficult to overcome, or big, big issues that we worry about today that I feel my kids think about. They don't think about gangs. 
they think about gangs in terms of kind of the national conversation, but in New York, they don't worry about the same things I worried about as a kid. They worry about terrorism, and they worry about superstorms, and they worry about resources being gone in apocalyptic situations where suddenly it's a blackout. And these are their fears. My son, for example, he, he they have school shooter drills, you know, which is the worst thing in the world. And um, one day he got locked in the hallway because they didn't realize he was getting water. And um, he won't go to school without a water bottle anymore, you know, because he doesn't want to, he's eight, and he doesn't want to get locked in the hallway because he's afraid of this idea of shooters. And so when I did Zero Year, the Red Hood Gang is that. It's meant to translate into comic language, but it's meant to be this random violence, and they celebrate that in the book. And you try and find ways of making Bruce about the things that you want him to tell your kids and yourself to be brave about. So sometimes it's your anxiety is like death of the family, is my anxiety is about being a parent. Whereas, and Endgame is my anxiety, you know, as well. But Zero Year was about, these are the things I want my kids to look at and be brave about. And that's what I think has changed a lot when I relate to so deeply about Bruce is that once I realized we're trying to make him a symbol of inspiration and bravery to a population facing very terrifying large problems that go beyond the city in a lot of ways, um, instead of a figure that scares bad guys back, it, I, it just took on a whole life for me. And that was around Zero Year. I remember talking to you about that and really getting that. So I, I, he speaks to me in that way. I think he's endlessly, endlessly interesting because he's, he inspires us all to sort of overcome whatever, whatever seems impossible to, to defeat. Let's, uh, I've got more questions, but let's, I want to open it up to, to the crowd. And, and who, who's got a question for Scott? Yes, yeah, me. Come on. Yeah. Sure. Uh, how did the, how'd the conversation go in the Super Heavy about shaving off Gordon's mustache? Yeah, but Yes, how did the conversation go about shaving off Gordon's mustache? It's <laughs> super heavy. We'll spoil it. The mustache is actually the big villain at the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? It's this radioactive mustache. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real identity of Mr. Bloom. Exactly. Mr. Bloom is like, it's just a mustache. <laughs> you forgot me. Um, uh, it went really interestingly because um, at first, they loved the idea, and then when they saw the art, they actually, there was a little blowback where they were like, is Gordon not going to be recognizable to people? And I was like, they were like, is there a way to give him a face mask to Batman so he can keep his mustache? And I was like, no, I, or he could just have a mustache, and Greg drew him once with his mustache and the cowl, and it was kind of awesome. It was sort of like 70s for a <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can deal with that, and then it was like, nobody's going to take that seriously. <laughs> and, uh, there's no way. And so, Greg and I had a lot of fun with it, actually. He, he, he kind of, I think, he kind of taunted them a little bit. What if he's like this? And they were like, no, you know, like all the variations of how bad the mustache would look until, until they kind of came. So I love it. I want to do, I'll tell you a spoiler, like I, I love writing Gordon so much. And when I got on Batman, it was like, I was writing Dick Grayson, and Dick Grayson was like young and terrified of being Batman and excited. And I was terrified of writing Batman, and so I was like, this is perfect. And then now I'm kind of like another book four years, and Gordon is kind of old, you know, and I'm like, this is perfect for me. Like, I have to be again. And the story is so young, it's such a challenging story in a way that I feel like a young writer on it, because it's juggling so many different things between Duke Thomas' story and Bruce's story, and doing all these different things. There's no place to hide in the story, which I love. And ultimately, um, yeah, I wanted to do this book afterwards where I was like, what if I keep Gordon this way and I do this book that's like Bullet, you know? I love that movie, like Stephen Queen, you know? I mean, what if he just like goes rogue and it's like he's got an awesome muscle car and it's like Gordon, you know, the gym, it's like that 60s kind of cool, badass thing and DC was like, yeah, you won't get back to that. <laughs> but it's in my mind, it's in my fan fiction. <laughs> it exists. Yes. Uh -oh. Besides Frank Miller's version of Batman, was there any other versions that really influenced you in you shaping Batman? Yeah, he asked me if there are other vision, versions of Batman that really shaped me. I mean, the biggest things in the DNA of our Batman are Frank Miller's Batman, the animated series, I would say, is, is just tremendous for me. I think you can see the fingerprint of that in my stuff. And honestly, Grant was a huge influence, both as a mentor. I've only, I mean, I, I don't know him that well, but the times that we've hung out, he's been very inspirational and his run is inspirational and, and epic and the thing that I love about his work even though we're very different writers and I marvel at like the kind of cerebral machinery he has in terms of this imagination engine um, and we're very different in certain ways that way is that he is so fearless and all the guys that I love that's that's what it is the women and men in comics that when you see someone doing a fearless interpretation of something and it's true core is theirs like when you read 
Brubaker's Captain America, you know what I mean? Or, or you're reading, or, or Willow on this Marvel, or you read, you know, uh, these books, you're like, that's not what I expected, and that's different. But that, that sees it from a whole new angle, where you're like, I can, and so for me, those, those are sort of my big influences on Batman. Denny O'Neill was a big influence as well, but, um, you know, all that stuff. Um, but those are my favorites, you know, I just, I'm always up for that stuff, like Thor, you know, when Jason was talking about doing Thor, and you're like, do that, you know, do that, because that's going to be epic, because I, I, lo I, I love, I don't know, I love when people take characters that I think I know as well as, you know, like possible, and then do something completely, completely unexpected that, that's still like Superior Spider-Man. I remember talking to Slot about it, and, and being like, you know, when he was doing it, not before, but, um, and being like, God, this story on paper, I would hate this story. It's so Dr. Octopus, you know, and brain switching. And then you read it and you realize it's a love letter to Peter Parker about why Peter Parker can be the only Spider-Man in your life. It's brilliant, you know? And so yeah, so those are the things that I would say I would say is my kind of big Batman DNA answers. Um, you, you decided to review or have to after the Joker fight through Alfred, how or why, what was your thought process to choose that device to reveal what happened to Bruce? Well, I love Alfred. She asked why did I use Alfred to show what happened to Bruce in 43, and Alfred to me is like the heart and soul of that mythology. He's the parent, and as a dad, I relate to Alfred so often, and as, as a kid, I relate to Bruce, you know, the son, I mean, and Alfred to me is the one that just is endlessly tragic. You know, I love him, but He's such an enabler in so many ways, too, where he wants Bruce to be happy, and he knows this is the only means to make him happy, but he's in for so much pain with it. And there's a very painful scene coming with Alfred where, spoiler, I'll give it to you, but the, I just have this scene in my mind, and it's not even written yet, but where Bruce is going to eventually, obviously, come back. I mean, right? I mean, you guys, are, like, it's not going to be forever. It's not and Super Heavy was never planned as this long epic. I'll tell you this, like, oddly enough, like, it's doing well enough, and you guys have been supportive enough that they they talk to me a lot about extending it. Um, but I don't feel, I don't want to do that. I like I like the shape of the story as it is, and I really, I, I told them, I called them up, and I was like, you know, um, should I keep going with this? And I was like, no, this is a story, it's a story. I know the ending, and I know it's all about something. It's, it's a story, like, Court of Owls was a story. You know, Cordell was saying, like, hey, I'm going to keep this album thing going a while, you know? It's like, no, it's a book, it's done. Like, it's, I don't want to keep it going. I want it to make, I want it to sit on the shelf as, as a meditation on something. And that's what this is. And, and um, Alfred sees Bruce when he comes back, and before he turns back, he just wants to, to look at him, to look at his back, because it's unscarred, because he was healed. And he just, he just wants to hold him and look at him for a minute as a son before he gets all those scars. Again, he knows he'll get, he knows he'll get them back. You know, all the terrible things that are going to happen to him as Batman again. He just looks at his back and just, can you give me a minute? You know, just looking, looking at you, my son, before you go back and change back and all the torture and pain I'm going to see on you again. And so Alfred for me is the heart that way, you know, and very, very, I love that character. Sorry about this character. He'll get it back. <laughs> but um, he, He's that, he's that tortured parent. You're watching your kid do something that you know you don't want them to do. It's like if my kid, I have this fear my kid's gonna be, he loves wrestling. He just started loving wrestling and I have followed him down this rabbit hole and like taking to WWE and all this stuff. And he's like, I wanna be a wrestler when I grew up, Dad. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, please don't. You know, <laughs> I don't wanna see him hurt. You know, my big fear is he'll be like, I wanna be an MMA fighter, Dad. And I'll have to be in the cage, you know, like the octagon in the front. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, you know, and then sometimes he wants to be a writing nerd like me, and you know, that terrifies me. But it's the, it's the, the, Alfred to me is the lens of the parent watching as you see your kid do something, you just want them to be happy, and they're doing something, you're like, God, this is not going to work out, but it makes them happy, and I'm going to support them, and it's so sad. And it actually, Alfred plays a very, the whole, that whole idea of Alfred, not to get too spoilery, because I don't want to get too much away, plays a very big part in some future stuff I'm going to do with Sean Murphy. Back in the yellow hat. That's you. <laughs> yeah, is there any other property? Yeah, a ton, man. I want to work on Wonder Woman really bad. I want to work, I just, I, literally, I would have already taken Wonder Woman. Not, not taken it like in the way that I would, you know, 
I am totally supportive of what Dave and Merritt are doing. I mean, before they took it, um, even before they did it. There are many points where I almost did it, and I just, I honestly, I know that I do not have the bandwidth to do it the way I want to do it, where I can focus all my attention on that book. And I have a whole idea of the mythology and everything, but I just, I know it, I'll be, I can't do it half-assed. And if, while, I'm, while I'm doing Batman the way I'm doing it, and I'm, I really want to, I want to do a couple stories on Batman still, if I can swing it and figure it out, and depending on stuff with Greg and all that, and, and all of it, like if I can do these stories, I feel like you guys would be really, really happy with what's coming. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy with it if I can do it. So I just don't have the bandwidth to do that, and Witches, and American Vampire, um, and uh, AD, which I'm working on with Jeff Lemire. I'm just too old, honestly, at this point. When I was, I just look back, and it's only five years ago that I was working on like five books, and I'm like, yeah. But when I look back, the truth is it really hurt my marriage, and it hurt my relationship with my kids when I was working that much, and as, as excited as I get about, like, wouldn't it be great to take Wonder Woman and use some artist I love, you know, like if I could get a Sarah Kelly or Olivia Colquiel or someone like that, and just, I would love that. But even now, even if that was possible, I just couldn't do it right now. But there are a lot, there's that, Justice League, and, Spider-Man, I mean, there's a lot. You know, Captain America, is, I'd love to do one day. Ghost Rider. So there's there's a bunch, you know, there's a bunch. But I like to try and really balance it with Creator Own, man. I mean, Creator Own right now, it's, it's such, I really, I, one time I was really unhappy working in comics was when I was only on Superman Unchained and Batman, and that sounds awful because working with Jim Lee, and you get a phone call from Jim Lee, and I still, like, I saw it, it was like, Jim Lee, you know, and you're like, Jim Lee's calling me. Like, it was so, it was so, and Jim Lee is like a magical dude, I have to say, by the way. I'll tell the story about Jim Lee, where last year in San Diego, I wanted to go to this, I was doing these interviews with him, and I wanted to go to this Godzilla thing. Have I told you the story? I wanted to go to the Godzilla experience, because I'm a huge Godzilla nerd. And it was all sold out, and Jim was like, ah, hang on, we were like doing some interviews, like, boop, 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 and he's like, we have tickets. And I was like, wow, awesome, Jim, you're the best. And he's like, well, I'm gonna go over there, I'll meet up with you, you know, I'm gonna finish this interview stuff, and I'll meet you there. And I'm like, yes. And I like huffed and ran, it was like five blocks away, and I just ran right there, and Jim was already there. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like how did you get over here? And he's like, what do you mean, I just walked. And I was like, oh my god, and I know, I know this day I made a, a straight line. I can see the place, like, from where I was. It wasn't like I did, like, a loop de so, yes, it is Jim Lee's magic, always. Um, but I was like working on this thing with Jim Lee, and that's like a dream job. And I was working with Greg and doing Zero Year, and it was my favorite thing. And I didn't have any creator roles, because it was in between the wake and this other stuff. And uh, American Vampire was on hiatus because I raffle wanted some time, and I wanted some time. And I got really depressed, really nervous. And I, it's like I had dream jobs, but when you don't have a place to go, for me at least, when I don't have a place to go that's totally my own, where I know everything better than anybody because I'm making it up, and it's a place to explore without the pressures and the restrictions of, of, of Big Two Comics. It doesn't work for me, so if I didn't have that, I could probably try another superhero book, but it's just an unhealthy balance for me. I need to have creator own really be a priority for me right now, just for both my mental health and for... I, it keeps me fresh and young, you know, to try challenging things. Like, I'm doing a graphic novel right now, it's book After Death with Lumiere. And it's part prose, and it's part visual, and it's different than anything I tried. And I think it's, I'm looking at it like it might be one of the best things I've done, or it could be awful. I have no idea. I can't tell yet. Um, but, um, you know, it's those challenges that I feel like the balance of those things that keeps you, or keeps me vibrant and exciting to myself, you know? In the back over there. Hi. Hi. Um, my question for you is what advice would you give a writer who wants to? I would say, she was saying, well, what advice would I give to writers trying to write their own graphic novel? I would say this, like, today it's easier than it ever has been to make your own comics. And when I was a kid, I mean, I think there was this kind of idea that you would pitch to the big two, and you would go and pitch ideas. They really don't accept that stuff anymore if they ever did. It's really what they want is to see you at a con like this with your comic, giving it to people and showing that you, you have the tenacity to produce something, whether it's digital or print and then you put something together that really shows your voice, whatever that voice is. And don't, don't do stories with their characters, they don't want to see that. They want to see you make something that's original, that's yours. They're looking for new talent all the time. You know, there's people whose whole job is that. Um, so what they want to see is you out of the here with a comic that you've made, you know, um, promoting it and giving it away, giving it to editors or selling it to them and, and having some level of I guess, of, of success in that regard, where it sounds like a paradox, I mean, to make a comic, to be able to make comics, but it really is that way, where it's your resume, it's your thing that you make, and, and that's what I'd say, it's like, 
you know, writing, writing, doing it, even a ten-page thing or something where you say, "This is this is my voice. This this is what I care about. It's hard, right?" You know. All right. So um, obviously, there are a lot of DC movies coming out soon. And so I just had a question: If Zack Snyder or Ben Affleck asked you to look at their Batman movies, you know, <laughs> think a little bit about it, and you know, help them write it or, or just talk about it, would you accept that, or would you like to stay in comics and? You know, let the movies go off. Oh, if I had to choose between them? I would, I would say comics if I had to choose. I, I'm waiting for you to be like, I am Zack Snyder. <laughs> 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 um, no, I'd say comics. I love it. I, don't, I have never had any interest in, in writing for film or television, really. Um, and I have offers now to do that stuff, and it's not, it's just not appealing to me yet. I mean, Maybe one day I'd like to try that. I mean, look, if they came to me and said, do you want to read the Batman script and help on the Batman script specifically, of course I would. I would love, I would love that, you know, or that would be a dream. But that's a particular project that I, I feel like of course, it would be an honor to shepherd the character that we work on in comics to, into film. Um, but if you're asking sort of, am I like waiting in some way to make that transition, I'm not. And, and I, I have, you know, lucky right now, I mean, one of the great things about comics is they're, TV and film are desperate for, for properties, and it's a great time to be doing independent stuff where a lot of it, like witches and that stuff, gets snapped up. And so those offers and that that world is there. I think once you start to get your feet in the door, it's also lucky too. But um, as a career change or something like that, I have no interest in doing that. I really love writing comics, and I don't know. I don't want to become an idiot, but I love this. Uh, I was I was just wondering, you've been, maybe you've been asked a couple times already, uh, I was wondering what was the inspiration or the story behind giving Bruce Wayne uh, a brother? And oh. Court of Owls, uh... The idea was what was the inspiration for giving him a brother. Um, Court of Owls to me was like, first of all, it was like terrifying. So it was the first time I ever wrote Bruce, and Dick was so easy to write. He just, also, the fun thing about Dick is that all you have to do is like turn a couple butt shots once in a while, and everybody's super happy. <laughs> so it's like, and that was the weirdest thing is when I was writing Dick Grayson, like I would get all these requests where it was like, could you please give us more like shirtless Dick Grayson and more, you know, butt shots of Dick Grayson? And I was like, this is a really serious book. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like so baffled by this. And then at the end, I totally got it. And I was like, oh yeah, I get it. All right, sure. And I was like, chop, throw him, you know, butt shot. But it was always like, now he's being killed. Like it's the end of the story where it's like murderously hard on him. But when I was reading Bruce, and that's one of the fun things about Bruce right now, is I, I was teasing the Grayson guys, I was like, we're going for our own version of sexy, because Bruce can never compete with Dick, where I'm always like, I'm always like, oh man, you know, Bruce Wayne is really, really sexy, man. I'm like, look, I'm gonna, I did one in Zero Year, he has a, like, a, a panel, I remember, where he's like pretty much naked. And I was like, ah, oh, something coming in. You know, like, for eye candy, and, and no one cared, it was just like me. And I'm like, what the hell, because everyone's like, Grayson. <laughs> And so Bruce can't compete with Dick that way, Dick's like a different, but he's in, in Super Heavy is a whole different kind of sexiness. He's got a beard, he's shaggy, he's a man, he's a man, he's a man, he's, a man. he's like a man's man, and I really, <laughs> Greg, wait till you see him, oh my god, I said, remember when I said, oh, yeah. I said yeah. I to him, I was like, in 46, he has his first like sex scene that I've ever given him, ever. And I feel bad like I've never given him any romance or anything. And it's basically, he's like, as a shower scene. And I sent it to him, and I'm like, oh my god, look at this. No, it's not racy or anything. It's just that he's so handsome. And you're like, oh my and lord. The, and, the, and Julie, it's like, it's really like, I, anyway, the, the whole thing was like, uh, um, I, with Dick, it was so easy to write because he was so emotional. And with Bruce, it was, I was so terrified in Court of Owls because I was like, ah, oh, it's so fun. Bruce, you know, Dick and I are friends and he just talks about everything. He's like me and he just goes on and it's like, Bruce is like, shut up. You know what I mean? You're like, Bruce is not talking about his feelings. You got Alfred now being like, how do you feel? And he's like, her. You know, and I'm like, um, where do I get any of my stuff? And Court of Owls was then my way of saying, Bruce can't be that tough. He has to, if he knows the city this well, growing up in New York, one of the things that always fascinated me and still fascinates me about you know, Gotham and all this is its history. The idea that I grew up in the Lower East Side and my friends and I used to love to go down to Chinatown and that stuff. We would get M80s and fake IDs and all that stuff. You know, Chinatown, I had a belt with a Chinese star that I bought there. I was this little fat kid, it was just the worst. But anyway, the, I won't look back at what were you thinking of any of this. But the point is, um, 
I always was fascinated, even as a kid, by the kind of haunted quality of old neighborhoods. I feel like so many places in America, cities are just built for now, and for you, like where I live, where I used to live in the suburbs, it's like everything seems like it's built for your generation. But you go to places that are older in cities, like Baltimore or Philadelphia or New York or Boston, and you see these generations that must have lived there before you in the cobblestones and all of that. And I'm like, so Bruce, I was always thinking, I'm like, that man knows the city. He knows every inch, but he knows the politics, he knows this. He didn't know it five years ago because it changes really fast. And he won't know it 10 years from now. He can't have known it 20 years ago. So what if I can kind of weaponize that history and say, you're not as great as you think you are because you might know the city right now, but you don't know it 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It was different people with different dreams, different broken dreams, different achievements, all of it. And that's how that kind of came about. And the broader aspect was about how do I build a mystery? That's kind of how I write. So I have an idea. And then I'll be like, how do I make that idea flesh? I'll be like, well, I want to create a, if I want to show Bruce that he doesn't know the city, i got to start big, like a legend or something that he thinks that he's investigated that's untrue, and it seems, seems true. Then it's like, well, that legend has bases in Wayne Building, so okay, it's closer to him, he knows less. Well, actually, it has a history with his family, or it has a history with Dick Grayson. How could he not have known that? It's actually right under his feet. His own parents might be connected to it through, you know, through this stuff. So it's, it's figuring out what your story is about. Like, I figure out what it's about for me. Like, Super Heavy is a totally different structure. It's about what does Batman mean to us in the real world when we have these problems that we cannot solve as one person. Does he mean anything or is he a failed experiment? And so I'm constructing a story where you build a different, how do I get to that point? And you think about how you plot it, how you do it so you can be the most painfully resonant sort of um, ending of that somehow. And so for Court of Owls, it was bringing it closer and closer and closer until he literally realizes that under his feet, in his own buildings, his own family, there's mysteries he doesn't know about. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, working with Greg Capullo, how much of his work from Spawn and the Violator did you kind of try to incorporate into the Joker? I don't really ask how much of Greg's previous work, like Spawn and Violator, I, 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 I don't really incorporate um, any of it. Greg and I just have our own or where I know what he likes to draw, he knows what I like to write, and we found like a great balance where we're constantly sort of like, hey, you want to draw this? I want to draw that? All right. And it's really fun. I mean, one of the great things about working with different artists is like, I love trying to write a story about Batman. And get, like, like 44 is the same stuff in Super Heavy, but it's done for Jock because that's, he wouldn't draw the stuff in Super Heavy. It wouldn't appeal to him. So it's the same material, but it's that's what I would write, how I would write it for Jock, as opposed to for Greg, where it's robots and monsters and whatever. So if I worked with, you know, Fiona Staples, I would write differently, Batman for her. Uh, if I worked with Tim Sale or, you know, Latour, each one of those people, I, I'd still try to get to the same material I want to talk about, but construct a story that sh lets them shine and works its way through the that, their artistic sort of vision. So it might look wildly different you know, I might, if I was working with one artist, I might use art villains, and another, I might use street villains. But the same point in each story, you know? Does that make sense? Fed in for a while. Sorry. How do you feel about a Wonder Woman Batman romance? A Wonder Woman Batman romance, man. I, I, feel, I, feel, I would feel good about that. I think I would feel good about that. I mean, I, 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 I I have, a, I have an idea, not a romance, but a team up. One of the stories I want to do is a team up between them. And as I was thinking about them, they do kind of have a weird vibe. They have a vibe, you know? I don't know. I can see it. I can see it. I don't know. I, you know, I really, I just avoid, I don't know why I avoid romance so deeply in Batman. I think it's because I always feel like you know it's going to end badly, and so it always feels like you're setting it up to fail, or it's like, you know, uh, uh, this person's going to turn out to be a villain, or this person's going to be dead. And then we'll, you know, and, the base. Right, or whatever. And I try really hard to avoid that stuff. So even the romance we're doing now with Julie, um, I'm trying hard to sort of avoid, avoid a lot of those tropes and make it something that's a little bit more, a little bit more meaty, where this is a Bruce who basically is the boy who never got a chance to live. And he's free of Batman. He's living his life without those scars. And, who would he be? And this is the kind of person I think that that inspires him because she does the same kind of work that the Batman does, but in a real human way. You know, she wants the city to be better. And she she's a very um, dedicated person that way. And that trying to create a real romance for me is a lot of fun. And 
I could see it between them. I could. I could see it. Now I'm thinking about it. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. In the back. Yeah. No. I also wonder who was my first crush ever. <laughs> Linda Carter was like literally like my absolute first crush. I've told this before him, but I always had this fear. Like I was like at, as a little like teenager, I always had this fear that she would lasso me with her lasso, and then I'd have to tell her I loved her. You know, like, I can't even tell the truth, you know what I mean? And you're like, oh my god, I love you, but I don't want to tell you that. <laughs> it's almost so humiliating. Be awful. So, anyway. So the, uh, the writers and producers of the Gotham TV show have said that they have definite plans for more about sort of playing them in the evolution of the show. How does that feel, that character that she makes a couple of years ago, are about to make their first like screen appearance, not just a bunch of big action superhero movie, but a series that really concentrates on the city that you yourself have such a strong understanding and connection to. Thanks. It's, it was a huge thrill. Actually, Jeff Johns told me a little bit before they announced that announced that the um, uh, that that was coming, and we we become closer over the last couple of years. And it's been a real uh, pleasure uh, to get to talk to him more about stuff. And he told me, and I was just over the moon. And I was like, I have one stipulation. I was like, I get to be an owl in the back with Ray. And then you don't know me the owl, it's like <laughs> um, and just ruin the whole scene. But I, I couldn't be more thrilled, honestly. I mean, you, you Batman to me is like when I started writing about Batman, I, here's my worry about Batman. Like one of the truth, he's my favorite character in the world. And a lot of people like like Grant, right? Grant is, when Grant came on Batman, Grant is Grant Morris. You know what I'm saying? Like he has built his whole library and you, you there's no, there's no real risk in Batman for him, and he's going to make it awesome. But he also is already Grant Morrison. There's just a million things he's done that are amazing already, and he's cut his teeth, and he's a, he's a master. I, I, I was nobody. I had no, no, I had to ask Jock how many panels a page a lot of the time on, I was so new on Detective, and luckily these guys were huge mentors to me, Jock, and all of them, and you know, now it's sort of different where people are like, oh yeah, Scott Snyder and Jock, and, but I was, just remember, like, I had to convince Jock to do it. I, I went to a bar in San Diego and, like, was drinking with him desperately trying to get him to do that story, and I was no one. And so the thing I worry about a lot of Batman, I, I worry that there are days I just know I'm going to be a better writer in five years to ten years, and that I'm, I'm doing my favorite character first, and I'm trying really hard, I promise, like, <laughs> really hard to leave everything, like, out there and just give it everything I have and do stories that, every story has to be, like I said, it has to be a story I pick up and read, but it also has to be a story that's personal. You know, I, that's why I don't spin my wheels on the book, or not spin my wheels, but that's why I avoid doing small stuff, is because every time I feel like you want to do the story that there's a million people that would kill you to do your job, and they have a Batman story they're dying to tell, and it's their important story that's personal to them, and if I'm going to take a room on this book, I better have one like that my feeling, or move over and let someone else do it. And uh, ultimately, my fear is that I'm going to be a much better writer when I'm more experienced, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting my chance to do this book now, and I'm still really green. I mean, I, I constantly feel like I'm like, oh God, like, you know, how did I make that mistake back there? And I wish I could, I wish I, but then I was, I, I was talking about this to Neil Gaiman, I'd only met him very briefly, and then I got to hang out with him at a Vertigo thing not long ago, and I was thrilled, and I was sitting with him. And he's a, just amazing to watch, also, with his story. And he tells stories, also, just like you wanted to, where he was telling about the story about how he went to this shoe store in, in London, and it was like this oldest shoe store in like London, and how they kept the molds of everybody's feet beneath the thing. And he's like, they call them lasts. You know, I went to his accent, because it always sounds like I'm doing like a Jamaican accent or something when I do like my British accent. And um, he was like, the last, the last of the dead are beneath, and they have Frank Sinatra's last, and they have this last, and it's like exactly the story you want to go from Neil Gaiman, really, you know? <laughs> and um, but what he said, which was so great, he was like, Scott, Scott, Scott. He's like, because I was telling him, you know, I told him that. And he's like, right now you're worried you're not good enough. In a few years, you worry you used to be better. <laughs> like, oh, okay, it never ends, does it? <laughs> never ends. And I was like, all right, you know what, I get it. So that's, but that's my fear is I'm, I'm writing a character, like I, would, I wish I had five, ten years to cut my teeth on characters coming up, like where, where you know, it was sort of books that were more under the radar, but I didn't. I, I feel like I got thrown into the giant spotlight and 
you know, there's stuff I wish was better that I had done in different ways too, but I'm trying my best, is all I can say, you know, I'm trying my best. So. It's really hard to talk in the mask. <laughs> uh, in Death of a Family, you gave us a really interesting joker, and uh, you talked a lot about how important Bruce Wayne is to the universe, and kind of the, the end of that run was the fact that the Joker kind of openly ignores that side of him, like that bit about him, and the fact that he pushes the family away and everything. In a lot of ways, I, I don't know, I just would like to hear, um, he's, mm, man, I totally had this great idea in my head. <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, he's kind of everything, all the fan, like all the ways you can look at Batman wrong. Yeah, and I'd love to hear you speak about that. Yeah, he was saying that Joker and Death of the Family is kind of has a very sort of interesting relationship to Bruce, and that he's almost as he just he just he he just dis, uh, discards the Bruce Wayne persona entirely and stuff. And what I say, Joker, Joker is my favorite villain. I love writing Joker. And every time I'm like, I'm never gonna write him again. I'm like, ah, I have another idea for him. So I have an idea. I'm actually kind of tinkering with the graphic novels right now, but. The thing that I love about him, everybody has their own iteration. I love Grant, so um, my iteration of him is that he is kind of like the devil to Bruce. And what, what he's saying is he sees what you're afraid is true about yourself, and then he makes that thing true or says, I know that it's true. I'll show you it's true. And I think what Bruce, for me and Death and Family, he's afraid in some ways that these relationships he's made and his family he's built is somehow making him vulnerable and mortal. And Joker's like, you got into this business to be a legend, to be immortal, and that's what all your villains have done. We all have transformed ourselves into these things in your honor. We are your royal court, and I am the jester, the hands of the king. You need to come back to what you always thought you should be. And Bruce denies that, and then Endgame is sort of like, I'm going to show you how big you could have been and how big I am. And I invited you into this, and you rejected me, and now you're going to see how small and mortal and human and ineffective and meaningless you are. So it's one big arc, and ultimately that's about my anxieties. I mean, the thing that I worry about to propose when I'm in a black place is like, what is the point of all of it? Like, what, 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 you know, you, you feel yourself inching towards, you know, death and all of it. And, and, and it, it's like, it's when you feel bad, or I feel bad, it's like standing on a frozen lake is the best way I can describe it. Everybody else is having fun skating, and all you can think about is what's beneath and it's going to crack at any moment or melt or whatever. And Joker to me is saying to Bruce, he's reminding him of his own mortality. That's the point. He's saying, everything you do is meaningless. Every relationship, every you try and fix the city, it doesn't work. In 10 years, it'll be back. It's all sand. But I'm going to prophecy you for that. And ultimately, what Bruce is saying is, and this is why what I meant earlier, where he's an inspiration like for, for bravery, kind of a post-9-11 environment, Bruce is saying, everything matters. Make your life matter. Take tragedy. My parents died in a meaningless act. It's like as almost meaningless as it can come over nothing. You know, over pearls, over nothing. Uh, no big conspiracy. I'm going to take this thing that's meaninglessness at its core and turn it into an engine of meaning where I'm going to be someone that says, make your life matter, make what you do affect people and affect the world every day, and don't be afraid that all of it means nothing. And that's that's kind of my Joker. You know, is that he's like, oh, it means nothing. And he'll always be there haunting him that way. And they're locked in this battle of, of meaning and meaninglessness, of purpose and, you know, and void and absence of that. Um, take me away from Batman for a second. Uh, I want to write like Clark. I want to write Bernie's and Dick and all these other characters that they kind of connect to you at different points in your life, where, like your fears and anxieties. So. What was it like when you wrote Superman Unchained? You know, Superman is a very different character as our Lois and Luther and all these other characters. What parts of you did, did you sort of find to connect with those characters in their very different world from God? Yeah, he asked what, what I connect to about Clark. What I love about Clark is that when you look at him, everyone thinks of him as this like symbol of all goodness and truth and justice and that. But he's actually just like, he's wrong about everything a lot. Like where he's, he's built Superman to be something that's ephemeral. Like think about it like this, like Clark Kent isn't going to age, right? But everyone around him is going to age. So like five years, people are going to start being like, what's up with Clark? Like, you know what I mean? Like, why is he not aging? What is, what's, he's weird. Um, similarly, Superman, it has no affinity with any government. 
and he stops things, like, you know, depending on your version, he gets involved in things, he will stop, like if someone had an atom bomb and was going to drive it, well, you know, he will stop it, and so governments are going to start building weapons to stop Superman, and yet he won't ally himself with any country. Everything about Superman wouldn't last very long. Like, the whole construction that Clark has made can only last for a moment, like a flash, and then be gone, because none of it would stand. You know, it would all fall apart over 10 years, 15 years. Everything would fall apart. But he does it because that's his compass, and I love that about him. That he seems to all of us, of course he's doing the right thing, but when you look at what he's doing, it's actually, it is the right thing, meaning morally. But it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of, he's, he's doing, he's doing, like he's doing for all of it to come crashing down, but he says, I don't care, I'm doing what I think is right, right now. And that's what I connect to, is that sense of, of purpose and, and this kind of ethical compass that's private that you say, this is what I'm doing to, to make life make sense to myself, and I don't care if it makes sense to nobody else to me. Uh, really explored Bruce, obviously, and Alfred, and on the villain side, the Joker, the Riddler. Do you have a Damien story inside you? I don't. Yes, if I have a Damien story, I'll tell you exactly why. I, I cannot write that character I've tried. And the reason is, my son is 10. I mean, son is 8. And Damien is 10. And I just cannot, I cannot wrap my mind around watching my son get punched next to me on the street, fighting, no matter what I do in that book. I cannot. I can't write him, it's a flaw of mine. I love reading about him, I love reading Pete's version of Grant, but he is just a character that I hate Bruce for in a way that I can't. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't make that leap somehow. It's my own shortcoming as a writer, but I cannot accept that Bruce would allow that in some way. My version of him, even though I technically play along with it and have Damien, you know, he's just not a character I can write effectively. I just I I really disagree deeply with Bruce doing that, and I it, it troubles me. I I, I can't even when you see how little an eight year old is or a ten year old, and you think about it. I know it's ridiculous because it's like hit girl, or it's I know it's comics, and he's an assassin, and he's this, but I just can't. It's, I cannot suspend my disbelief beyond it as much as it's, I hate saying it. It's, it's so it's embarrassing, honestly, because it's a failure of imagination. But I see my own kid, and I can't do it. So Damien's just not my bag. And, uh, and which is, uh, at the end, you said that it's it's kind of an a autobiographical look at you and your fears as a, as a father. And um, I, I have only a, a three-year-old, but, but when I read it and I see the, the dad and sailor and how he's trying to get her over her fears, it really speaks a lot to me. And, you know, you have to let kids grow, so you have to let them scrape your knees, but it really breaks my heart when she does. And um, I was just curious, you know, how... How did you allow yourself to come to the place to, to be vulnerable like that, to put it out there? It was actually kind of hard. I mean, I when I started Witches, I knew it was going to be really dark, but then I called, I, I saw how dark I was going to go with the stuff that was more personal about it. I had a lot of trouble when I first became a dad, and, you know, I, I was very, um, I mean, there's a lot I'm really proud of, and then there are moments I'm really not proud of where I was acting out against the responsibilities of it and stuff like that, and I feel like I wasn't the best husband or dad, and... You know, I've talked to a lot of my friends, and what I realized over time was that those feelings, not what you do, how you act matters, but those feelings are more common than I thought about the tremendous fear of, of all of it. And, and the, you know, you don't think about those things before. And I called Jock, honestly. It was, I spoke to him a lot. You know, that's one of the things. And, and he's the best, dude. Jock is the best. He also is the best smelling man all the time. That's a magical cologne that everybody talks about. And you're like, what is that cologne? And he, and I, he never said it. He won't tell me, but it's amazingly, amazingly, uh, you know, it's amazingly shy um, and soothing. But anyway, he's, he, and he's like a great big gentleman. And I would call him up and just say, listen, I think this might be getting a little too personal. And he's like, if you change that, I want to do the book. And I was just like, all right. You know, because we went into it together, and I think we have a lot of similar experiences and stuff. And, he kept me really honest with it, and I appreciate that. And the second arc is similarly honest. You know, it's we're working on it, and it's, it largely focuses on Sailor um, having moved on, and she works with this big group that kind of hunts witches, and she's living in the desert in the southwest where there's no trees anywhere. Um, and then she starts to believe in some way that they might be keeping Charlie alive in some terrible way. And it's about letting go of your parents the same way the first. It's like all of us, when you're a teenager, you're a kid, you're growing up, you have to separate from your folks. 
or you're my age and your parents are getting older, you know, and you worry about whether they're not going to be there. It's a lot about those things, so. We are actually five minutes over. Oh, I didn't realize. Nobody, uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> well, okay, thank you so much, you guys.